We continue our study on the book of Hebrews, Substance and Shadow, and we are now in chapter 8. I've titled this one, A Better Covenant, or a subtitle, if you like, The Pattern on the Mount. Before we start, let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a privilege to study the Word of God. What a privilege to be able to read about a shadow that has been replaced by a substance. Bless us as we delve into these words. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now chapter 8 is basically a sanctuary message. Jesus is the high priest of a better covenant. In Hebrews chapter 8 we read, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Now here's a very plain statement in Scripture that the earthly sanctuary was a model of a greater reality, a tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. So if we take God's word as it stands, then there is a sanctuary in heaven and the earthly was patterned upon it. Let us have a look at the chiastic structure. This one is a bit different than the others that we have done. It has an A, B component, so it's not like a sandwich. It's more like a comparison, where A stands for the new covenant, and it's contrasted with B, namely the old covenant. So if we go to Hebrews 8 verse 2, it says, A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. If we go to its counterpart, which is A with an asterisk, then we read, For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So we have a true tabernacle and we have a new covenant. If we contrast the two Bs, Hebrew 8 verse 7, for if that first covenant had been faultless, now referring to the typological one, the shadow, then should not place have been sought for the second. And if we contrast that with B, in that he says a new covenant he has made, the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxes old is ready to vanish away. So the two contrasts tell us something that's very important. The shadow one served as a type and it is ready to vanish away. Whereas the new one stands forever. Now, many people don't want to accept this and cling to the shadow, thereby denying the substance. The typology, the structure of the book tells us clearly that there is a replacement of one form by another. As we discussed Melchizedek, for example, Exactly the same thing. He served as a type of the greater reality. So if we look at John chapter 14, verse 6, it reads, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. This is the better substance. This is the real fulfillment of the shadows and the types. Colossians chapter 2, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. This is the whole aim of the book, to show the Jewish people and 
the entire world that embraces the truth as it is in Jesus, that there is no other way to salvation other than in Jesus Christ. So if we look at the heavenly sanctuary, do we have any report other than what the book of Hebrews tells us about a heavenly reality for the earthly copy? Well, if we go to the book of Revelation, then this one speaks about the ministry of Christ in heaven. And verse 12, chapter 1 says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. So here in vision, John sees a glimpse of the heavenly and he sees Jesus, the Son of Man, walking between the candlesticks. This title, Son of Man, we read in the book of Daniel, where one like the Son of Man comes to the Ancient of Days. So this is Jesus ministering in the holy compartment, the first chamber of the sanctuary, and we find it in the book of Revelation. So this cannot refer to the earthly sanctuary. Revelation 8 verse 3, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with a prayer of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Here's another glimpse of the first chamber, the holy place, where he sees the ministration at the altar of incense. So it's a clear description of a sanctuary which is not an earthly sanctuary, but a heavenly sanctuary. Now if we jump ahead to Revelation chapter 11 verse 19, there we get another glimpse, and it says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of the testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. So here we have a glimpse into the most holy place where the ark of the covenant was kept. So clearly the Bible tells us that there is a heavenly sanctuary. And to allegorize it would to re be to remove a very clear statement of a ministry that is taking place in heaven. It's interesting that Revelation 11 comes at a stage where the ministry transfers from a ministry in the holy place to a ministry in the most holy place. So this is Day of Atonement language because only on the Day of Atonement the priest entered into the most holy place. So does the Bible speak about a sanctuary, a literal sanctuary, that is in heaven? The answer is yes. Paul says it quite plainly. God built it. He pitched it and not man. And the book of Revelation in vision tells us that John saw at the ministry taking place first in the holy and then, as the story progresses closer to our time, he saw the ministry continuing in the Most Holy. So let's continue with Hebrews chapter 8. So verse 3 tells us, For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore it is of necessity that this man have something also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, says he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed thee in the mount. So here we have another confirmation that the earthly is a shadow of the heavenly. 
and the earthly priest had to have something to offer, and so the heavenly priest must have something to offer. Now, the offering of the earthly was animal, an, an animal offering, and the blood was the symbol of the life that was shed, and so the heavenly also had something to offer, the blood of Christ, which is the life which he gave for us. If we go to Exodus chapter 25, when we read in verse 9 onwards, according to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments, thereof even so shall ye make it. And look that thou make them after their pattern which was showed thee in the mount. So obviously Moses was given a tour in vision of exactly what it was that he needed to construct a copy of in miniature here on this earth. And it didn't only include the building, it also included the detail of every single item in that sanctuary. And every single one pointed to the greater reality, which is Jesus Christ. So we need to learn lessons out of all of them. And then it goes to the candlestick. And it says, for example, and this work of the candlestick was of beaten gold. Unto the shaft thereof, unto the flowers thereof, was beaten work. According unto the pattern which the Lord had showed Moses, so he made the candlesticks. So not only what it should look like, but how it should be made. This was also important. So it's interesting that the candlestick was made of beaten gold. So when we read in Colossians chapter 2, verse 17, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ, or the reality, the substance, is Jesus Christ, then it tells us that everything that was constructed pertained to Jesus and his ministry. So if we repeat this to really internalize it, as Moses was admonished of God, when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, says he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Verse 5. So when we study the sanctuary, then we must learn lessons out of it. It was pitched in the middle of the people with the tribes pitched in a particular order right around. There was an outer wall of white linen. And even the way in which these posts were planted is of significance. For example, some of the posts had to be placed on silver footings. And this silver was prepared from the redemption money, that quarter shekel which was melted down and served as a pillar or a base for these pillars. Now that's interesting because the Bible says, He who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the house of the Lord. So what does this pillar stand on which stands for the humanity? It stands on that redemption that release from the penalty of sin. So if we build on another foundation other than Christ, then we have no foundation. So this foundation was the redemption that we find in Jesus Christ, which makes it possible for us to be a pillar or to be compared to one of these pillars. And we're admonished to stand like a needle to a pole, like a needle to a pillar. And there was an entrance, one entrance, which was called the gate. And you entered in there, and then you came across the altar of burnt offering, which had a brass covering over kitim wood. Then you had the laver. We'll talk about that in particular. And then you had the sanctuary, which was divided into an first compartment and a second compartment, and it had a particular covering. So just looking at the 
symbolism here. The white linen, of course, the Bible tells us that the white linen stands for the righteousness of the saints. Now, we have no righteousness other than a righteousness which is imputed and imparted by Jesus Christ. So it stands for the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And Jesus himself said that he is the door. So when you entered into this opening, this door, you were entering through the ministry of Jesus Christ and you came into his presence and immediately you are faced with the altar of burnt offering. And exactly what happened there? The lamb, the fat was burnt and certain components. You had the priest who would minister unto a repentant sinner that had come in through this opening, placed his hands on the lamb, as we will see, in type transferred the sins to the lamb, and then with his own hand he would kill the lamb, typifying the fact that Jesus died for us and that we are responsible for that death. Then you had the laver where ritual washings took place. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And then we enter into the other chambers. So there was this outer court, and that represents the earth. So the gate, the door, and the veil represent the three dimensions of Christ's ministry. So the three dimensions, of course, were the sacrifice itself, the ministration in the holy place, and then in the most holy place, progressive one after the other, because the earthly served as a type for the heavenly. There were four pillars for the veil, and here was the veil, so there were four pillars, and four coverings, four colors, four ingredients in the showbread. So this means that salvation was available to the whole world because four is the number of those on the earth. There's a north, a east, a west, and a south. So four represents the earth, five represents humanity. There's so much detail in every single item and how it was prepared, and what the base was like. We don't have the time to go into all of those details, but it really is worthwhile studying these things. And then there was this tent with these four coverings, and we can look at them in a little bit more detail. The outer covering was from badger skin. Now, badger skin didn't look very magnificent. It was not a, a glorious appearance. And uh, it's interesting that the badger is also an unclean animal. And one wonders why the outer covering should have been of badger skin. And the answer is that Christ veiled his divinity with a covering of humanity. So it represents Christ the lowly Savior, he who became sin for us, who took our uncleanness upon himself, and it is represented by the badger skin. So there was no comeliness to the outer covering that we should be attracted by it, but it was something to contemplate. Why would he take badger skin? because he who was sinless became sin for us. The next one was a skin of rams dyed red, and that represents Christ the sacrifice or the sacrificial savior. Then there was a covering of the woven goat's hair, and there was pure white, so that represents the righteousness of Christ or Christ the sinless Savior. And the inner one, or the royal covering, blue, scarlet, and purple, is Christ the worthy King, or Christ the exalted Savior. So this is interesting. The inner one that you couldn't see from the outside was the, the royalty. He veiled his royalty. He veiled his divinity. 
so that he could become one with humanity. There are so many lessons in this sanctuary. If we look at the holy place and behind the veil, the most holy place, then in the holy place there was the candlestick, then there was the altar of incense right up against the veil, and then there was the altar of showbread. Now if we look at this veil, we'll see that it doesn't go all the way to the top. And it was completely closed because the high priest only entered into the veil, behind the veil, into the presence of the ark once a year on the Day of Atonement. But when this incense was burnt on the altar of incense, then the smoke would ascend over it and would come into contact with the ark of the covenant. And it is over the Ark of the Covenant, which serves like a throne between the, and the two covering cherubs, that the Shekinah glory would appear when God communed with his people. So he, he basically spoke through the veil. And the veil, of course, represents the flesh of Jesus Christ. So both the outer gate plus the door to the first chamber plus the veil to the ho most holy place, they all represent Jesus Christ. So as we said before, when a penitent person came into the sanctuary, then he would lay his hands on the offering and the sin in type was transferred to the lamb. That's very important. He didn't confess his sins to the priest. He confessed his sins privately over the lamb. And the lamb then became the substitute pointing to the great antitypical lamb, Jesus Christ. There was also a rope, which isn't depicted here, which tied the lamb or connected it in a very intimate way with the altar of burnt offering. And when the fat was taken out, and burnt on the altar, this represents the sin, the inner sin that had been expiated, which had been removed. And then the sinner stood justified before God. The priest himself, of course, also represents Jesus Christ. But because he was an earthly priest and subject to death, therefore, he was succeeded by the next generation and the next generation. But he pointed to a greater reality, which is a immortal high priest that will live forever, namely Jesus Christ. It's also interesting that when the priest officiated, he would take a tiny portion of the flesh once it had been uh, prepared and eat it in type, transferring the sin that had been confessed over the offering to himself. So he became in type a sin bearer. And when he offered for his own sins, because he was a, a mortal man, a sinner just as all of humanity is depicted, then he would offer that sacrifice for himself plus all of those that had been internalized or confessed. And he would take some of that blood into the holy place and apply it to the horns of the altar of incense. So in type, the sins were then transferred to the holy place as it were a record, a hard disk, a hard drive with all the confessed sins of the children of Israel. And this record of sin accumulated over a year. And once a year, even the record of sin was removed. But we'll come to that later. Now, inside the most holy place, you had the Ark of the Covenant with the two covering cherubs. And uh, the Ark of the Covenant was made of chitim wood and it was covered with pure gold and Inside was the covenant, 
or the moral law, the Ten Commandments on the two tables of stone written on both sides. Originally there was also a pot of hidden manna and there was also the staff of Aaron that had budded. Now it's interesting that that staff, when it budded, produced not only leaves, but also produced fruit and flowers. So the entire process was depicted in one miracle. It budded and it produced the leaves, it produced the flowers, and it produced the fruit, representing also that process of sanctification through to the production of fruit. Now, beside the ark was the book that was written by Moses, the scroll, and that represented the ceremonial law. Now, the ceremonial law was not placed in the ark. So, the ceremonial law was beside the ark. So, this mercy seat at the top, which covered the ark, shielded one from the condemnation of the moral law. The moral law of Ten Commandments. If you break one, you break them all. And the wages of sin is death. It's the breaking of the law. Because sin is the transgression of the law. That's a reference to the moral law. That's why the mercy seat covered it. So we continue with Deuteronomy 31, verse 24 to 26, and it reads, And it came to pass, when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book, referring to the ceremonial law, until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the ark, not in inside the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee. So this book of the law, this ceremonial law, which contained all the types and shadows, was there as a witness against thee or against us. Why should that be? Well, the moral law had been transgressed, and so humanity was in sin. So the Bible says the law was added before trans because of transgression. Now, the, there is no transgression if there is no law, because the Bible also says where there is no law, there's no transgression. So if it was added because of transgression, then it must have been added because of the transgression of another law. And that, of course, is the moral law. So the moral law was transgressed and necessitated the addition of the ceremonial law. And the ceremonial law was the shadow that pointed to the greater reality, the substance, Jesus Christ, who would come and redeem the world. And it is a testimony against us because it requires death. It requires death of the substitute. So the shadow lamb had to die because it referred to the greater antitypical lamb who also had to die, namely Jesus Christ. And it condemned us. And that is why we were responsible for that death of the lamb. And it showed us our part in this entire sad story. It told us that we were responsible for the death of the Lamb. So if we look at the two major divisions of the law, the moral law and the ceremonial law, then we will see that the moral law is called the royal law. James 2 verses 8 and 12. It's also called the law of liberty. So this law is a law that is the law of liberty because if everybody keeps it, then people will be free. Imagine everybody keeping the law of God. What a wonderful world this would be, wouldn't it be? You could walk in the streets without fear 
of being accosted by some criminal. You could have your house open, no need for locks or anything to keep the thief out. You would not have to worry about a covetous neighbor who uh, had evil thoughts because you possessed something that he or she did not possess. Everybody would have a conviction that God is enthroned rightfully on his throne. The first tablet, there would be respect for God. There would be no other gods beside him. Idolatry would be something that wouldn't exist. And time, precious time spent with God would be kept. So it's called a law of liberty. It sets you free from the bondage of sin. Now the law cannot provide that. So the ceremonial law was added because it pointed to the greater reality, which is Jesus Christ, who would be able to restore that liberty. In Exodus, we are also told that this moral law was written by the finger of God on stone. It was placed inside the ark, according to Deuteronomy and 1 Kings. And it existed before sin, because where there is no law, there's no transgression. So if there was a transgression, then the law must have existed. And we've already discussed this in, in many other lectures. But sa Satan could not have sinned. Lucifer could not have fallen if there had not been a law. Now, which laws did he break? The Bible says he broke them all. But it started off with coveting the position of God. That is breaking the Tenth Commandment. If you covet the position of God and you want to place yourself in that position, then obviously... You want to be God as well. That's breaking the first commandment. And if you consider yourself in that place rightfully, that's breaking the second commandment. It's idolatry. It's disrespect for God. It's taking his name in vain. If we go through to the second table of stone, honor your father and your mother, well, who was his father? God was his father. He was dishonoring his father as a consequence and he proved that he was willing to kill him because he instigated the crucifixion of Jesus. He was a liar from the beginning because he never told the truth about Jesus. And he was a thief because he wanted to steal a position. So that's the moral law that was transgressed in heaven already and then continued here on earth. So the the moral law tells us what sin is. So Romans tells us that the purpose was to reveal what sin is. It's called a complete law. It's called a perfect law. It's called a holy law. It is stated that it is just and that it is good and that it will stand forever. So the moral law is cast in stone. That alone should tell us that it can never be removed. And that's why Jesus said he has not come to take away the law. Not one jot or one tittle will by any means disappear from the law. The ceremonial law, by, in contrast, was also called the law of commandments contained in ordinances. We can read that name for it in Ephesians and Hebrews talks about it. Deuteronomy tells us that it was written by Moses, as we just read in the book of the law and was placed beside the ark according to Deuteronomy 31, 24 to 26. And it was added bef because of transgression. In other words, it was given after sin. And the purpose was to reveal the remedy for sin. And it was temporary. It had to be replaced by the reality now, when we come to the laver, there are some interesting things that we can say about the laver, but let's first read what Martin Luther said about these ritual washings that took place at the laver. Martin Luther said, The reason that Christ washed not his own, but his disciples' feet, whereas the high priests and the law washed not others, but his own, was this. The high priest in the law was unclean and a sinner like other men. Therefore he washed his own feet and offered not only for the sins of the people but also for his own. 
But our everlasting high priest is holy, innocent, unstained, separate from sinners. Therefore it was needless for him to wash his feet, but he washed and cleansed us through his blood from all our sins. So Martin Luther had a very fine understanding. Now isn't it interesting in this world that we live in, that we on a regular basis read in the news how the papacy, for example, the Pope, will wash the feet of people, but he doesn't wash his own feet. What does that tell us? Because even the high priest washed his own feet and not the feet of others. Whose position is he then emulating? Isn't he thereby saying that he is another Jesus Christ in the flesh? It's actually a position over and above that of the high priest who at the laver had to wash his hands and his feet before he could enter into the holy place made by hands. It's also interesting that this laver was constructed from the looking glasses of the ladies, in other words, the mirrors. They were made, of course, of polished brass, and these were taken and created this laver. They were melted down and reconstructed. Now what does that tell us? Looking glasses can be interpreted as a form of vanity. Not necessarily. It's fine to look at what you, you look at to see if you are presentable. But if it is something that becomes a tool of admiration of the self, then it is a problem. So it actually stands for humility. And for this humility to again take place or to position itself in the hearts of men, it was necessary that this demonstration should be made and that it was melted down to become the laver and represent a cleansing from everything that is earthly. Now the candlestick was the other instrument that we talked about and uh, it had seven candles all receiving their oil from one central core. It had to be pure, pure olive oil. And sometimes these wicks were made from the attire of the priests so it represented righteousness. Now it was made from beaten gold because every single portion of it, no matter what it was, whether it was the flowers, the ornaments on it, or the entire structure, was made from beaten gold, representing the righteousness of Christ and Jesus Christ who was beaten for us in every aspect of his earthly life. So there's beautiful symbolism in all of these. And the altar of, of incense, it had, of course, a crown around it representing the royalty. It had the horns of the altar and it was made of kittim wood overlaid with pure gold. And we read in Revelations 8 verse 4, And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the hand of the angel. So in other words, the high priest in his ministration would offer up this incense and it represented the prayers of the saints made acceptable to God. In other words, transformed into an acceptable form to go and reach the heavens. That is really quite amazing because the Bible also says that the Holy Spirit intercedes with groaning to make our prayers acceptable. So this is how we pray through Jesus Christ. And then the altar of showbread. We read in John 6, 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Now this show bread was to be replaced on a weekly basis. There were 12 loaves, and it represented the 12 tribes of Israel. 
And it also represented, of course, Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven that was given for the life of the world. Now, later on in the history of Israel, this earthly sanctuary, which was a portable sanctuary, was replaced with a permanent structure. It's interesting that many of the, the pieces of equipment were supplied with rings of solid gold, like the altar of incense and the showbread and the candlesticks and uh, the Ark of the Covenant. And they had to be carried on poles by the priests. And they weren't allowed to touch it directly. That's why these poles were inserted. And the other equipment, like the boards and the poles, etc., that were uh, the rest of the construction, they were allowed to be placed on carts and transported on carts pulled by animals. Now, the Temple of Solomon was a permanent structure. And even there, the pattern was precisely again given in vision and had to be followed to the minutest detail. So we read in 1 Chronicles 28 verse 10, Take heed now, for the Lord has chosen thee to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Then David gave to Solomon his son the pattern of the porch. So David had received in vision, just as Moses had received in vision, the exact pattern of how it had to be built and of the houses thereof, and of the treasuries thereof, and of the upper chambers thereof, and of the inner parlors thereof, and of the place of the mercy seat. So every single detail, as in the case of the portable sanctuary, was supplied in vision to David, and he handed it over to Solomon his son. And the pattern of all that he had by the Spirit of the courts of the house of the Lord and of all the chambers round about of the treasuries of the house of God and of the treasuries, dedic the dedicated things. So every single item was again manufactured according to the pattern. We read in the Spirit of Prophecy, God gave David the pattern of the temple which Solomon built. None but the most skillful men of design and art were allowed to have anything to do with the work. Every stone for the temple was prepared to exactly fit its place before being brought to the temple, and the temple came together without the sound of an axe or a hammer. There is no such building to be found in the world for beauty, richness, and splendor. So every single detail, even how it was to be constructed. And it's interesting that he, Solomon created a quarry even on that very mount. And today there is this gap between Golgotha and the mount where the temple is situated. And these stones were cut out there precisely and hammered. They represent, this quarry represents the world. And it is in this world that we are to be hewed and squared and where the chisel and the hammer is supposed to correct the faults in our characters. And once that stone was built into the temple, no hammer and no equipment was applied to it. It was complete. It represents humanity having been incorporated into the heavenly. So our character building must take place here. And the change of heart must take place here before we are built into that heavenly temple. And uh, we are told in the New Testament uh, that we are living stones built into a living temple which in the future will represent the redeemed of all mankind. Now, obviously, if the old has to be replaced with the new, if the type has to become the antitype, if the shadow has to become the substance, 
then there must be a changing of the priesthood. And we looked at that in the previous chapter. But now let us go a step further. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 6. But now has he obtained a more excellent ministry. By how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now let's just stop there for a moment. Does God make mistakes? The answer is no. Is he infallible? The answer is yes, he is infallible. So how could it have been full of fault? Well, we're talking about substance versus shadow. The shadow is incomplete, but it served its purpose. It pointed to the greater reality. But being incomplete, it wasn't perfect. It was perfect for the time in which it was being used while the Messiah was not here. But it pointed to that reality and therefore couldn't fulfill the totality of the new covenant. So when he replaced the old covenant with a new covenant, the old one was faulty only in the sense that it was not the reality. But it was perfect in its depiction because it was an exact copy of the reality. But once we have embraced the reality, then that should be our religion and not the shadow. Let me give a silly example. If you have a picture of the one that you admire and love, and you look daily at this picture, and this picture is to you almost like a reality, when the reality comes, and you can embrace the reality, you can embrace the person that you have this relationship with you. Is the picture of any value then? Or would you say to the reality, step aside, I don't need you, I have a picture. It's as silly as that. If the shadow has given place to the substance, then why cling to the picture if you can have the reality? So when Jeremiah prophesied about this new covenant, it was still a future covenant. So let's just go there. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, says the Lord. They could have understood it. They could have studied the details. They could have deduced from the shadow what the substance was going to be like. But the shadow became to them their reality. They clung to the picture and they ignored the reality. Verse 33 says, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, in other words, future, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So does it say that he will take the law away in the new covenant? No. He will write it into their inmost parts. Now this covenant, does it affect only the moral law or does it also affect the ceremonial law? I would say both. Because once the substance has been revealed to us, then all the shadow that pointed to us becomes a reality to us and is written in our hearts. And the moral law, likewise, instead of being written just on tables of stone, would be written on 
the tables of the heart. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. Now, why should they all know them? Of course, only those in whose hearts this covenant has been written will know him. That means they understand what the types and the shadows pointed to and have embraced the reality, the substance. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Now, how does this covenant differ from the old covenant? Well, the old covenant was a two-way covenant to which all the people agreed. Let's just read it there. Exodus 19 verse 5. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded them. So he read to them the Ten Commandments, etc. Then verse 8, And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. So there was a two-way agreement. God gave the instruction and the people agreed and said, this we will do. And God took the word of the people, or Moses took the word of the people and brought it to God and said, it's a deal. We will do it. God then spoke the details of the covenant in Exodus 23, giving numerous promises conditional to their obedience. And again they answered, Exodus 24 verse 3, And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said we will do. So there was this two-way agreement. Now, if we think about that, then we can possibly agree when I write here how lame this affirmation was. Hardly had the words left their mouth and they were dancing around a golden calf. The defect of the covenant lay in the weakness of the fallen human nature and the consequent inability to put away their sin. The defect didn't lie on the part of God. God gave the covenant and he added numerous promises, every single one of them by their own admission later, having been kept by God. So the weakness wasn't on the side of God. The weakness was on the side of man. Human nature is slow to learn that as we receive justification, so we must also receive sanctification. The new covenant had to be different. There had to be a change. So if we continue with Hebrews chapter 8, verse 9 says, Not according to the covenant that I made with their father, so he's reiterating what Jeremiah had said, in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, says the Lord. So now our question is, how is the new one different? The answer is, it is not based on what we promise, but on what he promises. Hebrews 8 verse 10, now let's listen to this carefully. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. 
If we jump to Hebrews chapter 10 and borrow verse 16 for a while, it says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds will I write them, quoting from Jeremiah. So this new covenant is not a two-way covenant in a sense. It is a promise of God, of what he will do. Now the heart, of course, is the spiritual and emotional experience. The mind is the intellectual experience and your memory database. And the law is inscribed in the deepest affections of the one who receives its being. So obedience is because of love and not because of anything that you undertake in your own strength. So if we go to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 11, it says, And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. In other words, if this law is written in your heart, then you will know God. And if you know God, then you will allow him to work within you and to bring about that action and reaction that comes solely from him. So to know God, even in the deep things of God, and to be known of God is obviously the deepest experience to which any man is capable of. So this is the basis of the new covenant. Now, the Old Covenant was based on good promises, according to the Bible. And the New Covenant, according to the Bible, is based on better promises. So, the Old One is earthly. It's the earthly church and a nation under God. It spoke about deliverance from Egypt. It brought the people to an earthly Canaan. It had an earthly sanctuary. There was an earthly Jerusalem, there was an earthly priest, and he was mortal, there was mortality. So if we go to the better promises, we have a heavenly church and a nation under God. There's deliverance from sin, not just deliverance from Egypt, but the fulfillment thereof, what it stood for, deliverance from sin, a heavenly Canaan, a heavenly sanctuary, a heavenly Jerusalem, a heavenly priest, and immortality. Well, obviously, these, these are better promises and therefore represent a better covenant. Does this now mean that we do nothing? That God does everything for us? And the answer is basically yes. God does everything for us, except that we have to consent. Because the Bible says he stands at the door and he knocks. And he won't force himself. He's not a coercive God. But if we open, he will come in. Now, if the, the soul temple is defiled, then what will Jesus do? What did he do when he came to the earthly sanctuary? When he entered into it the first time, didn't he cleanse the sanctuary? Yes, he did. And any accumulated thing that was out of place, wasn't there a second cleansing of the sanctuary? So when Christ enters into this earthly sanctuary, there will also have to be a cleansing of the sanctuary as he performed in the earthly sanctuary. If we reject him, then eventually there is no more sacrifice left and he will leave the temple as he left the earthly temple. So let us like the disciples and those Christians that embrace the truth, embrace the truth and allow him to change that which is an obstacle to our relationship with him. And how do we achieve that? Well, it is a process. It is a lifelong process. We have to internalize the word. He will write the law on our hearts. That means we must start to think as he thinks. We must have a transformation, a total transformation. 
The word repent means to turn around, to walk the other way. And the only way that we can achieve that is if we allow him to walk the way for us, in us, through us. Hebrews 8 verse 12 says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Isn't that an amazing promise? And that he says, a new covenant he has made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxes old is ready to vanish away. So my question is, so where is the other side of the covenant where we promise what we will do? It's not there. Why? Because it'll fail. Just as they failed, we would fail. So only what God does in us can succeed. And may God give us the willingness to subject ourselves to the hammering and the beating of those stones to chip off the rough edges so that when the product is complete because we permit him to be the master builder, then it can be built into that temple and there will be no more crying, there will be no more tears, and the promises of God will have been fulfilled. We have one life in which we permit him to create this change in our disposition. Once the work is complete and we enter into the heavenly Canaan, then the growth will be only in the realms of that which is right. And this is the plan of salvation, a restoration of that which was lost in Eden. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the sanctuary message which points to the ministry of Jesus Christ. And thank you that the old covenant, which was based on our strength, has been removed and has been replaced with a covenant which is based on your strength. Help us to make right decisions in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.